Some might find this a tedious job, but uh, this is at, at an absolutely perfect morning. The uh, temperature is like, you almost need a coat on. Uh, we get a breeze so there's no bugs. And uh, I'm in the process of, uh, of collecting my stitching material. So I'm in Mother Nature's uh, warehouse, if you would. And uh, it's not coming out easy. Um, we once uh, harvested um, in sandy soil and it's so much easier because we're in really, really hard old marl clay here. But I've got a fair bit of route to start. So in the construction of this canoe, I'm gonna need um, about 350 to 400 feet of route. Uh, I have built canoes that needed over 500 feet, so <laughs> I'm getting off easy this time. Anyway, off to get these processed and uh, I can, I'm gonna actually start stitching today. I should point out when you're, when you're harvesting root that um, if you can find an area that's almost a monoculture of spruce. So um, black spruce is the Cadillac of roots. Well, we don't have black spruce here. I'd have to go quite a ways north to find them. So I'm using white spruce. Uh, it works really good, uh, except for the soil that I mentioned. Uh, the one pine that you can use is jack pine, and if you go a bit north of us, you will find it in sand, and uh, it's really easy to harvest, and you get much longer pieces. So, um, in the stitching process, and I'll be demonstrating that, if, if your piece isn't long enough, you splice, so, and the splice is hidden. So it's still, it's still good, it just takes a little bit longer. But it, if you look around this woodlot, you'll see that it's almost all spruce. So we've got the odd oak in here, there's the odd cherry tree. But for the most part, it's 95% it's spruce. So when you're excavating, you don't have to um, expect to find a whole lot of other varieties of root, which you've got to work around. So if you're just finding spruce root, it does make the job a wee bit easier. Hey, you. Hey, thought you could use some help today. Hi, you can always use some help. Never been one to turn down help. We're gonna need a lot more root. So are you splitting it first and then peeling it, or peeling it first and then splitting it, or what? I'm splitting it first. I'm soaking it in that boiling water helps, and if I split it first, sometimes the bark comes off easy. You're starting at the skinny end or the fat end? Fat end. And then, watch, if you see how it's never round, so it's kind of oblong shape. So if you make your cut across the long way of it, if it happens to be a narrow route, you're going to get you're going to get more. That didn't start very handy. What if it starts sliding off center? Now let me just get this guy. See if I can get this guy back to center. So if it goes off center, as you're as you're splitting it, once you've done a bit of this, you close your eyes. But you push pressure on the fat side, just like I did when I did the stem pieces for the canoe. So you, that gets it back to center most of the time. And then you just, you can feel it as it goes down. So again, it's run off a bit that side. So I want to bring it back to this side. So I'm going to bend that fat side. Okay. And that would be fine if you've got, uh, I think you got most of the, or that one doesn't have any hair on it, but these small little root fibers, you pluck them off first, kind of like plucking a bird. You get them off first, it, it'll peel somewhat easier. Some, some you can just strip one end to the other. I don't know what it is. And then others, they really make you work for it. So well, we need a lot of root. But the thing, thing of it is, for every root we harvest, it's doubled. So because we're splitting it, we need about 500 feet. Roughly four to five hundred feet of root. This one's coming down the middle really nicely. Yeah, that's good. So two hundred and fifty feet of root split in half gives us five hundred. <laughs> so we're starting with our first. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have twelve feet. You're going to have. You got a short piece there, about four. So you're going to have about eight feet when you're done. So yeah, we got to harvest a lot more. And these guys, I think they're going to fudge pretty soon. They're a noisy lot, those uh, house wrens. Almost every box back here has got a house wren in it. And, uh, okay. You got to finish one? So, 
Stitch on the side panels. Side panels go on today and then uh, I can get on with my... So are you just, um, we're just going to peel enough for the side panels this morning and then we'll just do it as we go along? Yeah, I don't need very many pieces. Uh, I need probably about 30 feet if, if of material. So we just got to do a couple more. And uh, we'll, I find it works better if we... Um, it works better if we get it fresh. I don't know why that is. They say you can, and other builders will harvest the whole canoe's worth of root and store it in water, but I just find if you dig the f number of feet you're going to use for the day, it just seems to work better. Okay. So, okay. To, so today we just, uh, I think we're pretty much, well, we got to do a couple more and we're done. So what I do with those guys, once they're done, I put them back in the boiling water by the fire. Okay, I'll get that. We're um, sewing the side panels on now, and I'm using a saddle stitch. And <laughs> this bark is awful thick, which is good. I mean, it's going to be a durable canoe. Uh, but what I'm essentially doing, so I've got two threads, and I, I'm putting one through, and I'm bringing the second one out the same hole. So to make the initial hole, I use a, a um, three-sided awl. And the reason I don't use a drill, if I use a drill, I remove the material in the bark. And so when it, it all dries up, shrinks down, tightens up, if I use the awl, I'm not removing fiber that the drill would do. So the first hole goes through with the a triangular awl. In order to get the second bark through, I can't, I can't use this one to enlarge the hole because it would cut the, the first thread. So I use a, I use a round awl to, um, to enlarge the hole, which I'm going to do now and start and then once the side panels are done, I will be um, uh, dissecting my gunnels, taking the outer gunnels off, setting the inner gunnels in, and getting my shear line. I may be a little shy of bark, so I may have to take a little bit of the shear out that I initially planned on, but we'll see how that goes. So I demonstrate a little closer here um, what I'm talking about. So I've got I've got two threads or roots, um, and and so this one's passed through from the outside. Now I'm bringing this one and passing it through the same hole from the inside. So essentially, well, it's a, called a saddle stitch, and uh, it's a strong stitch, and it's easy to waterproof when I'm all finished. So, and at the start of it, what I've done is I've locked in the two existing threads here. This guy I'll, I'll be able to cut off after and tighten that up a little bit, but essentially that's uh, what we're going to do the entire length of the side panel. And like I said, once that's done, the fun part starts because we set the gunnels in, we find that gunnel line, start trimming the bark down, and we start sewing, sewing it all together. And uh, yeah, before you know it, it'll be floating. So now I'm taking the inner one, passing it through the same hole to the outside.
everything wiggles and wobbles and it looks like it's fragile as heck but when this is all done you flip this guy over you'll be able to take a baseball bat or a canoe paddle or stick to the bottom of it and you you simply can't damage them they are a very strong craft and i think i mentioned in an earlier video with the exception of the bow and the stern so and the reason for that is we're not able to get a rib bent tight enough to get right in the very apex, if you would, of the front and the end of the canoe. So, um, but overall, a very strong craft when it's done. Next stitch. This is a slow process. <laughs> a really slow process. It's got to be about it's got to be about the journey and not the destination when it comes to canoe building. But it will float someday. Okay, that was the uh, kind of the moment of truth uh, to see if everything worked out like I planned. Um, so I'm just a tad short on the bark, but I suspected that. So my two end thwarts, the short little guys right at the bow and stern, they have to be a little shorter, which will give me a bit tighter of a, a bend to the, or a point if you would, to the bow and stern. 
So in terms of bark, on my side panels work out. What I, what I was looking for was bark that would be above where my gunnels are gonna sit, because it's gonna get trimmed off flush there. And I just barely, barely had enough right there at the center thwart, so that's perfect. Um, everything fits, and I got enough bark the full length on both sides, and um, yeah, as my mom would say, I'm tickle bake. This is gonna work. And I'm really liking the shape of it. It's, um, you never know till you sort of set the gunnels in exactly what it's gonna look like, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased with it, so. And yet more rocks. Rocks are a canoe builder's best friend. So I've got my inner gunnels in, uh, and I've got shear posts that they sit on, which establish the line of the shear. And I was able to, um, I was able to actually um, correct the front and back. So I've got enough bark now both ends, without having to make new short thwarts here. Um, so the next step I'm at right now is I've got. All the shear posts in except this end so what I'm looking for this end's got to come up quite a bit something like so and these weight this weight will help keep that shear line so we're looking for symmetry uh, front to back side to side and uh, we're, we're pretty much there so I got to make one shear post Okay, shear line's done. So I've got this, uh, my bow piece done. I've taken it out of my jig. And that's the shape I'm looking for. So it's gonna sit in the canoe on about an angle like that, which is the rocker. I explained where it's coming up at the bow. And it's gonna be quite high, which was typical of the Algonquin canoe. So I'm gonna stem or get some hot water on the next one and get it in the jig. Beautiful. 
So another measuring stick. So again, they didn't use tape measures. So that's uh, it's uh, two thumbs wide, which is two inches. If you take the thumb at the knuckle, that's pretty much an inch, an imperial inch. So I've got a two inch piece, and now I'm going to go down here and lay out the gunnels. Okay, so what we're doing now is laying out the, the gunnels. So we've got a rib that goes approximately every two inches. And then between the, so there's no lacing there. And then between that rib and the next rib, we've got two inches of lacing, then a two inch space for a rib, and then two inch spacing and, and so forth to the end. So I get this guy laid out and uh, we're pretty getting awful close to uh, starting to stitch on the uh, side rails. We have to do some adjustment on these guys. All the stakes have to go back in and I got to get it tied. So that keeps that symmetry of the outside of the, um, the outside gunnel to the inner gunnel because I can't really see it for the bark. So we're gonna get that all set and staked. That'll be the next step. So uh, a rib and a rib and then lacing. I'll put a little X there, which means lacing goes. Then a rib. Lacing. We got a bunch of stuff happening now, and uh, it's, it's actually starting to look like a canoe. A lot of hours in, but uh, you're starting to see the general shape of it. So I'm driving the stakes back in, tying them off to keep that symmetry front to back. And now I'm starting to cut down my excessive bark and driving the wooden square peg in a round hole. And wherever you see a peg, that, that will be a lashing. So lashing there, lashing there, lashing there, and in between will be rib, 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 full length of the canoe. And a whole lot of root gathering and a whole, a whole lot of stitching, but it's starting to take shape. So it looks, uh, it looks a little flimsy uh, as I'm pounding on it, but it's sort of a, if you think about it, it's the sum of a hole. So when you build a house, you put up the walls, they're a little wiggly wobbly. You put on the roof rafters, a little less. You sheet it, a little less. You close it all in and put an inside on it, and all of a sudden it becomes, um, you know, really sound, solid integrity. So this canoe won't have, it'll be flimsy and floppy until the ribs are driven in, and then it becomes one rugged canoe. Perfect, absolutely perfect. So this is my measuring stick. And that line, bottom line, is my center thwart. The next line is the thwart uh, e either side of it. And the top one is the uh, short thwart, the handle thwart, if you would, right near the bow and stern. So using the measure stick. Now that doesn't look like a very deep canoe, but what happens is the, um, it, it's flat bottom now. So it's like a punt. And in fact, once you take all the rocks in the building frame out, it doesn't look very pretty.
but then the, the, it morphs into this beautiful canoe shape once you drive the ribs in. So when the ribs are driven in on that flat bottom, they're take, taking that flat bottom and they're doing this with it, giving it this nice gentle curve, a little sharper bend near the gunnels. And, uh, and you may have noticed that the gunnels are quite a bit wider than the building frame. So it's actually six inches wider at the gunnel line than it is at the building frame. So that gives it the flared side. The flared side canoe displaces more water and the canoe that displaces more water can carry more cargo. So yeah, anyway, I got one piece of bark and two pegs and I'm done for the day.